Chapter 14 Letty reeled back, astounded and bewildered. The shock of seeing Wirt Roddy where she had looked for Lige made her clutch at the table for support. You? You? She stammered, passing one hand before her eyes to clear their vision. If she looked closer, surely she would see it was Lige after all. Yes, it's me, he said gravely. Then her fear for her husband's safety sprang up redoubled. Has anything happened to Lige? Where is he? He won't be home just yet. His level gaze met hers, but non-committally, revealing nothing of what she wished to know. She clutched his arm. You've seen him? He nodded. But where is he? The words tumbled over each other, and her clutch tightened on his arm. He's back at Rube Hitchcock's place. Still, his eyes, his words, cheated her of the truth. She beat her clenched hands together. But why? Why don't he come home? He looked at her for a moment, as if in doubt whether to tell her the truth or not. At last he spoke, grudgingly. He can't. He's drunk. But I never saw Lige take a drink. He don't drink, she gasped, incredulous. Sure, that's why he's knocked out now. Went to his head, you see, because he wasn't used to it. But didn't he remember about me? Her voice broke. Didn't he think of me being left here alone? He was laid out like a log when I saw him. He won't do no thinking about anything for a spell, I reckon. He's caved. His tone was devoid of feeling, as if he were trying to keep feeling out of it. She gave a low sob. The fellers said he was trying to borrow money for something or other. They didn't know what. Seems he didn't say. Only swore he had to have it. But they were cleaned out too, same as him. When he found he couldn't get the money, he called for the red eye and turned loose on it. Oh, 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 she moaned, the back of one hand pressed against her mouth. No need to worry. He'll be all right after a while. Sleep off his bat, have a helter-split headache for a day, and then he'll be as gamesome as ever. I know, I've been through it. His words brought no comfort to her. So, I came to tell you how he was. He'll not be back for a time, he explained casually. Her eyes of misery looked up into his. That was... kind of you, she stammered. Aren't you going to ask me to have a seat? He asked as he looked at her expectantly. Terror fluttered wildly at her heart in an instant, fear of Lige's anger. Oh, no, I couldn't. Lige wouldn't like it, him being away, you know. Lige left you by yourself, he countered. But he's drunk. I thought you were scared of the wind, he jibed. The panic that leaped into her eyes answered him. Oh, yes, yes. Then you don't want me to go away and leave you here alone in the storm? She shuddered, but her gaze met his firmly. I got to, on account of Lige, you know. The wind struck the shack with concentrated fury, as if determined to wreck it, while its shrill clamor filled the air. And what about me? he asked quietly. I wouldn't think you'd send a dog out into this norther. But Lige wouldn't understand. He's mad with me already, and he didn't like you coming to the house the other two times. Her eyes pleaded with him to sympathize with her situation, to understand her dilemma. He smiled grimly. I thought you were so tender-hearted about cattle and animals and all. 
I reckon you haven't stopped to think that the nearest ranch house is ten miles in either direction. My horse is beat out now. I couldn't make it. She was silent for a moment, her face contorted, her body quivering with the strain of her struggle to decide what she must do. If only Lige were there. The man's voice went on. No ranch woman would turn anybody, even a tramp, even a criminal, away in a storm like this with no place to go. It would mean my death, sure. Do you want to have any blood on your hands? With a shudder she stared at her hands, expecting to see visible stains there. The wind shrilled outside, the windows rattled violently, the lamplight flared in the gusts. The woman gave a despairing gesture of assent. "'You needn't be afraid of me,' he said gravely as he removed his coat and laid it on the table. His old mocking manner was gone. There was no gleam of laughter in his dark eyes, no flick of irony at his mouth, no satiric shrug of his shoulders, but in their place a seriousness that was restrained and stern. What experience, what emotion had changed him so? Letty sank into her chair, relieved in spite of herself, that she was not to be left again to the horror of solitude in the storm. The wind nearly drives me crazy, she cried. It was you that first made me afraid of it. His face grew more sober. Yes, I reckon I've got that on my conscience. And it maybe pesters me more than some other things that might seem worse. It was cruel, she accused him, her blue eyes fixed on his face. It's made me miserable ever since I came out here. I never can get the fear of the wind out of my mind, day nor night. You put it on me like a curse. And I had never done anything to harm you. I'm sure sorry, he said tensely. I'd give a lot to take back those words. I feel like a low-down hound. I'm always looking for a cyclone, like you described it. I lie awake at night thinking it's coming toward me, a big whirlwind that reaches to the sky. But they don't come so often, even in this section, he said with attempt at cheerfulness. One would be enough. Chances are it won't ever come your way, he said soothingly as to a child. You were such a pretty little trick and so bashful, I couldn't help teasing you. I ought to be hung for it. She shook her head and spoke with concentrated bitterness. It wasn't only just teasing. Everything you said about the wind has come true to me, except the cyclone. It has ruined my looks, my nerves, and my disposition. It's trying to break me, and it will get me yet. He gazed at her for a moment in silence, and then spoke, more to himself than to her. Your hair is not so yellow and wavy as it used to be. Your skin's not so white and soft. Your cheeks aren't pink any more, and your eyes aren't so blue as they used to be. It's the wind has ruined me, she cried harshly, accusing destiny, the fates, as well as him. The wind and the sand and the lonesomeness, but mostly the wind. It's damned hard on the women out here, he muttered, twisting his moustache nervously. I have thought of you a thousand times when you were up against it at first. But you never came to see me. You didn't show me a way out of it, she cried passionately. He put his hands together between his knees and gave her a long, long, thoughtful look. No, I didn't come to see you, nor show you a way out. That's one thing the angel with the big book will have writ down to my credit at the last day, even if there isn't much else to keep it company. 
I wanted to come, and I kept away. Why? Why? She flung at him. He faced her steadily, his look of evasion gone as well as his mockery. I thought it all over and wrestled it out. I was more than half in love with you, and I figured that there wasn't nothing a glute like me had to offer a little girl like you. Even if I was to have asked you to marry me, and I wasn't a marrying man, I wasn't fit for you. Oh! she cried, struggling to comprehend, to piece the facts together in her mind so that she could know the truth. He was not lying to her now, she knew, nor was he evading. The moment had come when he spoke frankly. He went on. And so I knew I'd better keep away. Girls had trusted me before and come to regret it, to wish they hadn't. I didn't want it to be that away with you. She was trying to take it all in. But you did come. Twice, she challenged him, when it was too late to give me any advice. He nodded. Yes. When a feller's got a maggot in his brain, keeping away don't always help. I came to think that if I'd see you again, I'd maybe find you weren't so pretty nor so sweet as I remembered you. And then it'd be easy for me to steer the other way. But I reckon I was just fooling myself. I was just an excuse I gave myself for coming to see you. But you said I wasn't so pretty when you saw me. Her words struggled forth, trying to find some flaw in his logic. You said my hair wasn't yellow, nor my eyes so blue, nor my skin so white. No, that's true. The wind had hurt them. But that didn't make any difference. He spoke with savage constraint. Beauty lies deeper in complexion. The real you hadn't been touched. But you kept away. Yes, it wasn't easy by God, but I did. I knew I had to. Yes, you had to, she whispered. So you see, that's how it was with me, he brought out as if speech were difficult. She made no answer, for words would not piece themselves together in her brain. Her very thoughts were inchoate, striving against each other, refusing to come clear. His sombre eyes gazed at her intently. Life has been pretty damned hard for you, hasn't it, little woman? His tone of sympathy released her pent-up emotion, and she smote her palms together. Oh, it has been torment! Pobrecita! The word recalled the other who had used the pitying endearment to her. Oh, it wasn't Lyta's fault. He's good. It's this country, this terrible country where it never rains and no green things grow and no birds sing. Some years there are birds, he protested with a trace of his old humor. She gave a rasping laugh. <laughs> there are none here now, except buzzards waiting for their prey. He smiled grimly. They are well enough fed now. Yes, they are the only things in this God-forgotten land that isn't starved or starving. Nothing here but wind and sand, wind and sand, till it's enough to drive me crazy. She made a wild, rending gesture with her hands. He watched her in silence for a moment, twisting his moustache, a frown of uncertainty on his forehead, his eyes restless. You need to get away for a while, for a change, he said. I'll go mad if I don't, but I can't, she cried, bitter remembrance surging back into her mind. That's what was the trouble with Lige today. 
I hounded him to get money from somewhere to send me back to Virginia to stay till spring. You ought to go. Yes, if I could rest and get my breath from the wind, I could be myself again. Oh, I know I'm not myself now. I feel like I'll jump out of my skin if I have to stay here through another winter and face these devil winds. He drew a long breath and then spoke rapidly, as if his mind were made up and he must not let himself think again. Come away with me, and you shan't need to face them again, ever. She shrank back, aghast. Oh, no, no, how could I? He leaned toward her eagerly, his hands outstretched, his words coming with swift passion. You need to get away. You've got to think of yourself now. If you stay here, it's like you say, you'll die or go loco. And what good would that do Lige or anybody? She felt the falseness of his logic, but was unable to argue convincingly as he did. She could only protest. Oh, no, I couldn't treat him like that. He's been kind to me and he's had so much to bear lately he'd soon get over it men do the old light of mockery was in his eyes not lige and anyway it would be wrong her eyes widened in horror as she realized what he was asking it's wrong to commit suicide isn't it he demanded Yes, that's a sin. Then to stay on here when you know yourself it's more than you can stand is committing suicide, isn't it? He leaned nearer and laid his burning hand on her wrist. She shivered and shrank away, but she could not marshal her words to refute his argument. The wind smote the house with redoubled fury, the timbers creaked and strained as if making a violent effort to hold together, and she could feel the structure rock and sway, with threats of leaving its foundations. She turned to him with sudden, desperate appeal. Why can't you lend us the money for a ticket for Virginia, so I can go home? Not on your life. He shook his head vehemently. That would mean me nor Lige either would ever see you again. I won't work it like that. She gave a little choking sob. Oh, I'd go down on my knees to beg anybody for a ticket home. I'll give you anything but that. Anything but that, I swear it. But I won't put the country between you and me. You say you didn't want me to be like those others, that trusted you and were sorry. She half whispered, her eyes on his as in a trance. He drew one hand across his forehead. I don't know what I want, except that I want you. His passionate words seemed to echo and re-echo through the room, their sound lingering in her ears above the clamour of the storm. No, no! Listen. His voice was tense and stern, almost savage in its vehemence. We can leave as soon as daylight comes and can make for the railroad. We can be a long ways off from here before Lige gets over his drunk. And then he can't stop us. No! No! Her words were an incoherent cry, unreasoning, instinctive. But Lige can't do no more for you now, the way he's fixed. And I've got money. I'm big rich, I tell you, and I'll give you anything you want, take you anywhere you want to go. What sort of woman would I be? She cried as memory crashed in upon her once more. He drew back, and then he shook himself as in a dream. Make it any way you like. You can get a divorce and we'll get married if you say so. I want you and I've got to have you. 
don't matter how blood beat in her head making it hard for her to think but her thoughts struggled as through an enveloping darkness and constriction through resisting forces that would be as wicked as the other way in the name of hell how sincere amazement was in his face his voice she made a gesture of contempt to treat lige like that when he has trusted me it's not his fault that he's down now the drought and the wind have been more than he could stand and they've nearly driven him crazy same as me he caught her hand in a tense grip that hurt her listen to me letty you don't love him and you never did and i'm willing to bet anything all i've got that you do love me his tone was triumphant his eyes exulted over her she wrenched her hand away and faced him in defiance you've got no right to say such a thing you won't deny it he taunted his eyes deliberately tried now to assert their old mastery over her emotions his very hand seemed menacing his lips curled in a smile an icy terror ran along her spine a frozen fire in her veins she turned to flee better to run away out on the prairie than to stay here better the madness of the storm and the dark than this what was that roaring in her ears was it merely the sound of the wind outside wild clamorous wailing like a troop of souls from hell she could vision the norther racing toward her across the prairies a wild stallion breathing death his hoofs of fire ready to trample her down to destruction fear had her by the throat as she paused her hand clutching the doorknob a shrill prolonged neighing came from outside the door was that your horse she jerked he laughed at her panic ah, quien sabe who knows a swirl of wind swept into the room from the cracks in the floor from the slits in the walls from the crevices under the windows the flame in the kerosene lamp flared up brightly for an instant flickered went out her terror was so extreme that every muscle every nerve was tense as with violent action her fear her wild anger against the wind against this man tautened her body in a strain like that of mortal physical struggle her breath came fast and faster her heart beat suffocatingly her skin was drenched with icy perspiration her whole form shuddered as she felt the enveloping horror of darkness added to her terror of the wind and of this man who blew that lamp out she shrilled i don't know he answered coming closer to her in the darkness you did you know you did fear was throttling her i swear i didn't he said as his hand caught hers who was it then she chattered it was the wind the wind just at that moment a violent blast shook the house as if to tear it in pieces and send the splinters over the wide plain the door crashed open and a roaring blast rushed into the room half swooning with terror of the invisible the unearthly letty flung herself into Wert roddy's arms and clung round his neck as a drowning person would the wind the wind don't let the wind get me i won't he said hoarsely as his arms closed round her end of chapter 14